Warning, this video contains in-depth and graphic footage, images, and exploration of various highly invasive surgical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back to Installation 00 and the most detailed video series. The various classes of Spartans all received augmentations to forge them into the super soldiers they are widely known to be. The Orion candidates, the Spartan 2s, the Spartan 3s and the Spartan 4s have augmentations which are wholly unique to each class and the particular operational requirements of their generation. So in extension to our previous most detailed on the Spartan 2 augmentations, today we will look at the augmentations, alterations and enhancements that the Spartan 3s had in order to become worthy of the title of Spartan. Project Chrysanthemum was the codename given to the biological augmentation procedures performed on the Spartan 3 super soldiers. They represent a significant improvement over the augmentations used in the previous Spartan 2 program, retaining the procedures effectiveness but being safer and less invasive to perform. The bio-augmentation set improved upon the augmentations of the Spartan 2 program, pioneered by Dr. Catherine Holsey. With advances in technology, the casualty rate of the Spartan 3 candidates was usually 0% as opposed to the 56% casualty rate of the Spartan 2s. Most of the Spartan 3's augmentations were chemically induced instead of surgically implanted like many of the Spartan 2 enhancements. The genetic requirements of the Spartan 3 candidates were loosened from the exceedingly strict criteria of the Spartan 2 program, although the range of compatible individuals still remained incredibly narrow, with any aberrations from the required genetic set geometrically increasing the failure rates. Colonel James Ackerson, the mastermind of the Spartan 3 program, requested to have mandatory genetic screening put in place in the outer colonies in order to find more genetic matches for his program, but the Office of Naval Intelligence leadership felt this would only provoke the colonists for further aggression against the UNSC. As a result of the more lenient selection criteria, the Spartan 3 candidate pool was less physically and psychologically consistent, with a higher likelihood of behavioural problems. Many of the Spartan 3 candidates were more lively and predisposed for aggression than the Spartan 2s. While the chrysanthemum augmentation still had to be administered at the onset of puberty as the bodies of either prebubescents or adults would reject the chemicals, Colonel Ackerson's age restriction protocol for the Spartan 3 program was considerably looser than that of the Spartan 2s. The Spartan 3's candidates' ages upon induction typically ranged from 4 to 6 years old, with the nominal ages of some of them, such as Carter A259, exhibiting more extreme deviation from the standard age range. The schedule of the Spartan 3 program was accelerated from that of the Spartan 2's, because the Office of Naval Intelligence wanted to have the Spartans deployed in the field as rapidly as possible. The Spartan 3's were augmented at an average age of 12, whereas the Spartan 2's were 14 during their augmentations. As puberty had not yet started for the majority of the candidates at this time, they were given human growth hormone as well as cartilage, muscle and bone supplements added into their food over several months to artificially induce the onset of puberty. As a result, the candidates had the bodies of near adult Olympic athletes at an average of only 12 years of age, and it took some time for them to acclimatise to their larger physiques. This advanced preparation supplanted the need for the catalytic thyroid implant used in the Spartan IIs, as the addition of HGH and specifically tailored nutritional supplements led to early onset puberty and the required skeletal and muscle growth far in advance of the actual augmentation sets. The disclosed chemical augmentations used for the Spartan threes thoroughly enhanced the Spartan three candidates to super soldier levels, however, the quoted augmentations also appear to only be half of the story. In similar fashion to the Spartan II programs, there are likely several additional supporting augmentations that would have to take place in order for the primary quoted augmentations to actually work effectively. As such, when such instances occur, I will make note of them and make adjustments accordingly. 8942-LQ99, otherwise known to be the carbide ceramic ossification catalyst drug, is the first of the four primary chemical augmentations given to the Spartan 3s. The idea was to make the skeletons of the Spartans virtually unbreakable, allowing survival of harder impacts. The issue therein is that the drug was quoted as being a catalyst. The very word catalyst implies that it was either a substance that increased the rate of a secondary chemical reaction without itself undergoing any permanent chemical change, or that it effectively acted as a primer that precipitated another process altogether. This is the first instance we encounter a problem with the quoted Spartan 3 augmentations, but I am in a position to offer two well-reasoned and law-abiding means that the end result was still achieved with this chemical. 
The first being that the chemical itself was designed to travel to the skeleton and bond at the molecular scale with the bone marrow, osteoplasts, osteoblasts and oligodendrocytes, basically reprogramming them to use a carbide ceramic likely titanium carbide as the fundamental compound used for creating new bone material, as opposed to the calcium collagen matrix which is naturally used. During simple day-to-day -day movement the skeleton undergoes stress caused by simply moving under the force of the muscles within an environment of 1g of gravity. This causes microscopic stress fractures which are rapidly repaired by your own biological processes, keeping your bones tough and hardened against your environment. The aim with this technique would be to use this very process at an accelerated rate to lay down a matrix of titanium carbide and collagen, thereby molecularly strengthening the bones on the cellular level. The trick thereafter being to introduce colloidal titanium carbide into the Spartan's biology, likely through dietary ingestion. This would feed the cells responsible for laying down new bone material all the raw materials they need to gradually make the bones harder over time. We already observe a very similar process in medicine today. If a person takes a strontium supplement, the body doesn't differentiate between strontium and calcium due to them being very closely related, both being alkaline earth metals and chemical congenants to each other. The treatment is known to be used for people with osteoporosis as it adds skeletal density making fractures much less common, but in completely healthy adults the strontium is assimilated in making new bone material, resulting in denser though not necessarily stronger bones. Although this appears to be the most logical explanation as to why this chemical is being quoted as a catalyst, the results of an augmentation like this are a gradual onset of a stronger skeletal frame, as the bones naturally go through a new augmented process of laying down significantly harder and denser bone material than they'd be naturally capable of. It appears however that the Spartan 3s have significantly harder skeletons practically upon being revived from the augmentation procedures. This leads me to believe that this particular drug is in fact a chemical that precipitates another process altogether, priming the bones for what is to come. Due to the Spartan 3s apparent lack of surgical scars seen in the Spartan 2s, it is suggested that the carbide ceramic ossification augmentation is not the process that the catalytic drug is priming the bones for, so that rules out the surgical option. Instead, I think, in similar fashion to the aforementioned process of the body utilising strontium instead of calcium, a colloidal carbide ossification chemical is injected into the body as close to the bone as is plausible to get, to place this colloidal chemical in close proximity to the bones. Then a chemical process takes place due to the presence of the catalytic drug, whereby the bones rapidly uptake the colloidal carbide ossification chemical and assimilate it into the molecular structure of the bone, very rapidly reinforcing the skeleton to a much harder and denser state while shedding or converting the calcium matrix into a chemical byproduct, completing the catalytic process. This would explain why the Spartan 3s exhibit significantly stronger bones without the surgical scars of the Spartan 2s, but while also preserving the need for the catalytic drug in the first place. A8005-MX77, or the fibroid muscular protein complex drug, is administered to greatly increase the density of an individual's muscles, greatly enhancing physical strength. An assessment of the terminology used in the description of the drug reveals the mechanism behind how this particular drug achieves the desired results. Fibroids are non-cancerous growths that are made up of muscle and fibrous tissue. In normal medical instances they are undesirable and have to be monitored periodically or even have medical intervention to treat or remove. It is evident that this drug is designed to induce a similar mechanism to fibroid formation but in a more controlled manner with the more desirable results. As explained above fibroids are growths of muscle and fibrous tissue. The drug uses this otherwise abnormal level of tissue growth to its advantage by inducing the formation of muscle tissue on skeletal muscles in a highly moderated way, while also providing the new growth with a sophisticated protein complex to fully facilitate the muscular growth. It is likely it also achieves this via moderation of the body's myostatin levels. Myostatin, or GDF8, is a protein released by the body's myocytes that inhibit myogenesis, thereby capping how large muscles can grow to. To moderate this protein, the MX77 protein complex likely makes use of folistatin, which is the inhibitor of myostatin, thereby relieving some or all of the inhibition of myogenesis and enabling muscles to grow significantly larger and more powerful. This, in tandem with the augmented use of fibroids, would undoubtedly allow Spartan 3's muscles to grow significantly larger and stronger, overall granting the Spartan's muscles nearly double the muscle fibre density of a normal, unaugmented human. 88947-OP24 retina inversion stabilizer drug is yet another instance where the terminology used to describe the drug 
reveals it is either a primer or a supporting augmentation. In this particular case, a supporting one. In the normal human eye, and indeed in all vertebrate animals, the retina is inverted in the sense that the light sensing cells are in the back of the retina, so the light has to pass through layers of neurons and capillaries before it reaches the rods and cones. The ganglion cells, whose axons form the optic nerve, are at the front of the retina. Therefore, the optic nerve must cross through the retina en route to the brain. In this region, there are no photoreceptors, giving rise to the blind spot. The very fact that light has to pass through other layers of tissue before reaching the photoreceptors of the eye, even if those layers are highly transmissive to light, still means there is a degree of photoabsorption that takes place, limiting the ability for humans to see in the dark. Other animals, such as felines and canines, get around this by having a tapetum lucidum layer in the eye, a highly reflective layer that allows light to be reflected within the eye, maximising how much light falls on the photoreceptors, as opposed to being absorbed by the inner surface of the eye. While this would, at face value, appear to be the logical augmentation to factor into the Spartan's augmentation sets, in reality, the reflections within the eye caused by the lucidum also somewhat has a negative effect on visual clarity and focus in low-light level environments meaning creatures with this layer lack the otherwise crystal clarity of vision enjoyed during daylight hours. Humans would be no exception to this. So to maintain crisp focus and clarity, but also increase the amount of light that reaches the photoreceptors of the eye, the retina is inverted. This must be performed surgically, where the retina is effectively reworked, placing the photoreceptors of the eye on the surface, and the veins and neural axons are between the rods and cones and the actual back of the eye. Removing the veins and nerves from the path of incoming light allows more light to reach the rods and cones and thus results in significant improvements in night vision and colour perception. The actual aforementioned drug used in this augmentation appears to be used to simply stabilise the inversion surgery, reducing the chances of retinal detachment and thus permanent blindness post-surgery. This chemical evidently also has the side effect of altering the levels of melanin found in the iris of the eye likely due to chemical molecular bonding lancing the melanin out of the iris. This is made evident by the colour of Carter's iris changing from brown to blue while he receives his chemical augmentations. Since the brown colour of the eyes is caused by the existence of melanin in the iris, the sudden change to blue indicates that melanin, at least in Carter's case, was broken down very rapidly, diluting his brown eyes to blue. 87556-UD61 or Improved Colloidal Neural Disunification Solution Drug greatly improves the individual's reaction time, decreasing the time taken to react by 300%. A colloidal crystal is a highly ordered array of particles with diameters between 10 nanometers and 100 micrometers. It has been shown that particle packing and crystal structure in these substances is tightly controlled by particle size, chemistry and shape. Colloidal crystals have been heavily studied because of their unique optical properties, allowing them to behave as waveguides and may enable optical computing devices. They've also been studied at length due to their properties in regards to neural networks, whereby researchers from University of California Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab demonstrate a method for producing three-dimensional neural networks based on templates made with colloidal crystals. This colloidal crystal chemical is injected into the candidate along with a disunification solution. The two of these reconstitutes and disunifies established neural pathways, using the colloidal crystals as guides for the layout of a new optimized neural configuration. The colloidal borosilicate spheres are coated with a poly-L lysine to promote cell adhesion and attachment and then injected into the host, targeting the nervous system. Almost immediately, the neural structures within the host begin to bond to the borosilicate spheres. After a three-week recovery time, the result was a three-dimensional neural network with a realistic neuron density that could be influenced and guided to network formation by incorporating defects such as larger spheres into the colloidal crystal. The exact re-engineering of the neural pathways was likely calculated by an AI, so the massive amounts of data needed for such calculations would be checked thoroughly as small errors introduced into the early analysis could result in massive systemic defects in the neural cohesion of the host. Truth be told, it may be directly because of this exact augmentation that the effects of the additional illegal augmentations ordered by Kurt051 may have had even more of a pronounced effect that they would have originally had. In either case, the result of this augmentation was a complete restructured and re-engineered neural network within the host, linealizing neural pathways and thus increasing point-to-point -point nerve conduction velocity by reducing the distance impulses would have had to travel, while also reducing the electrochemical resistance of neural signals, allowing them to travel faster through the host nervous system. 
In addition to their chemically administered primary augmentation, Spartan 3s were subjected to a number of surgical alterations to enhance their capabilities on top of the ones we have already established would be needed, given the quoted chemical based augmentations. Their circulatory systems were also augmented from the human baseline, likely adding to a Spartan 3's endurance and resistance to shock, as shock is defined as being a life-threatening condition that occurs when the body is not getting enough blood flow. Lack of blood flow means the cells and organs do not get enough oxygen and nutrients to function properly, so augmentations to their circulatory system likely allows the body to blood shunt from extremities to vital organs, keeping the Spartan conscious, responsive and operationally effective for significantly longer. Like all UNSC Armed Forces personnel, the Spartan 3s are also implanted with a neural interface. In addition to the standard set of chemicals, Current 051 covertly had a set of three additional drugs added to the augmentations of Gamma Company in hopes of increasing their survivability in the field. All three had been outlawed by the UNSC Medical Corps in 2513. 009762-00, Neural Altering Non-Carcinogenic Mutagen alters key regions in the individual's frontal lobe to enhance aggressive response, making the animal part of the brain more accessible in times of stress. This allows the subject access to enormous reserves of strength and endurance and enables them to remain fighting even under the influence of a wide systemic shock that would be instantly fatal to a normal human. It is surmised that this is possible by effectively removing the natural limiter that the human body has to avoid causing significant self-injury. Humans normally don't get to utilise the full strength our muscles can produce. Our skeletons are more than strong enough to handle the force our muscles can theoretically produce, but the brain restricts how hard each individual myocyte, or muscle cell, can pull, meaning only during hysterical strength or moments of extreme stress and adrenaline response can we use our muscles at full force. Removing this natural limitation makes a Spartan 3 more sensitive to stress and adrenaline, putting them in a state where pain is no longer perceived. They exhibit hysterical strength, endurance and reaction time, but also has the knock-on effect of practically repressing higher reason centres of the brain, resulting in a blind rage, indiscriminate of friend or foe. It is reasonable to assume augmentations of the body's adenosine triphosphate response is put in place to allow the Spartan cells to uptake energy even when the body as a whole is already descending into shock. The other two chemicals administered are to offset the negative drawbacks of the neural altering mutagen. 009127-PX or Cyclodexion-4 is a bipolar integration drug designed to counter some of the effects of 009762-00 and 009927-DX, otherwise called misoalanzapine, which counters some of the psychological effects of 009762-00. The aforementioned mutagen, administrated only to the Spartans of Gamma Company, makes the Spartans more resistant to pain and injury, with stress or pain only increasing with their physical prowess. The Gammas are almost completely immune to shock, allowing them to endure injuries and physical pain beyond Spartans of any other generation. For example, Dante G188 was able to function for some time after a number of needle rounds had blown his chest open, initially not even realising his grave injuries. As a side effect, the drug suppresses higher brain functions over time, without the regularly administered counteragents colloquially known among the Gamma Company Spartans as smoothers. The Spartan will lose their strategic judgement and become more prone to impulsive, instinct-driven behaviour. This may also occur in combat under extreme pain and stress. After both of her legs were broken, Olivia G291 engaged and destroyed an aggressor sentinel with her bare hands by forcing it to the ground and smashing it repeatedly with a rock as large as her torso, in an uncontrolled berserk rage. Fred104 noted that she could have easily indiscriminately attacked both allies and enemies in this state, and in order to immediately return her to normal, Fred was forced to strike her in the head with the butt of his rifle. The blow had enough force to knock off her helmet, and was just enough to snap her out of this state. It should be noted that life-threatening, or indeed even fatal, injuries do not invariably result in uncontrollable aggression, as demonstrated by the example of Dante G188, who calmly limped into safety before saluting Lieutenant Commander Ambrose and informing the commander that he had been nicked before ultimately succumbing to the immense physical damage he had taken from the needle projectile. Olivia's case is suggested to have been the result of her using an immense pain to compound her strength and rage to the point she could no longer control herself. There are several different types of smoothers. The most common type is used during combat operations and is administered via hypodermic injection that lasts approximately 12 hours, after which its effectiveness begins to steadily decrease. 
Several factors such as stress and fatigue can precipitate the mental unravelling process. The first symptoms appearing within several hours of the smoothest effect wearing off include nervousness and irritability, eventually followed by paranoia, fits of temper and physical outbursts. After well over a day without a smoother injection, Mark G313 began having difficulties distinguishing friend from foe in the middle of a firefight, holding a combat knife to a marine sergeant's throat before being successfully convinced by Fred 104 that the marine was an ally rather than an enemy infiltrator. Another significantly more expensive type of smoother is a subcutaneous insert with a longer lasting effect. While they can only be changed out in a medical facility, they also cannot be lost or destroyed during a mission, like the more commonly used kind. The chrysanthemum procedures took place aboard the mobile hospital ship UNSC Hopeful. Because of the Spartan 3's program secrecy, the Hopeful was stationed in interstellar space at Vice Admiral Parangoski's order for the duration of the procedures. The ship's docking cluster Bravo and the eight decks surrounding it were entirely cleared of personnel to allow only to move in their personnel and equipment. The augmentations were administered over the course of a week. The subject was kept in a mostly sedated state throughout the process, which was conducted in a large open operation room housing 400 sections separated by semi-opaque plastic curtains. Each compartment was filled with medical equipment including sterile field generator overheads, as well as vital signs monitors and a chemotherapeutic infuser. The infuser contained vials of the various chemicals, which were administered to the subject via IV and osmotic patches. The Spartans were given a number of drugs to allow them to withstand the procedures themselves and counter their potential negative effects. These include shock reducers, analgesics, anti-inflammatories, anticoagulants and pH buffers. Despite the Spartan 3's expendable nature and lower grade equipment than the Spartan 2's, their enhancements represented a quantum leap over the previous program's bio-augmentation set. The muscular augmentations administered gave the Spartan 3 the strength of three normal soldiers. During Operation Torpedo, Spartan 3's ran at nearly 30 km an hour. Spartan 3's were also described to have been moving with speed and reflexes that no covenant could follow. They dodged snap necks and limbs, and with captured energy swords they cut through the enemy until the field ran with rivers of gore and blue blood. The Spartans of Fireteam Foxtrot engaged six Kigya in close quarters and left the alien's body snapped like ragdolls. Tom, B-292, 12 years old at the time and equipped with the SPI armor, engaged a Sangeli armed with a plasma pistol and an energy sword in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The Spartans enhanced reflexes, allowed him to dodge a plasma pistol bolt and sword swing at point-blank range. He then proceeded to throw the Sangeli warrior to the ground and finish it off with his assault rifle. During the battle, the Sangeli and Kigyar forces moved out of cover because they realised that it was suicide to face Spartans in close quarters. Approximately 300 Spartan threes faced thousands upon thousands of Covenant, including Covenant air support, and were described to have been winning the battle until seven Covenant cruisers emerged as reinforcements. During the battle on Pegasi Delta, most of Beta Company were roughly 12 years old. The physical abilities of any Spartan 3s who lived long enough to mature would supposedly have improved significantly as Chief Petty Officer Mendez stated that Spartans only grew stronger and faster as their bodies grew accustomed to their augmentations. Although the carbide ceramic ossification rendered the Spartan 3s bones virtually unbreakable, they can still be broken by extreme physical trauma. This was demonstrated when Olivia G291's legs were broken in several places by a three meter long slab of rock falling on them. During the Onyx conflict, one of the Spartan 3s briefly fought the Mjolnir armored Kelly 087. The Spartan 3 in question was able to momentarily hold their own against Kelly, being strong enough to twist her wrist and escape from her arm lock as well, despite wearing only semi-powered infiltration armor which does not significantly increase the wear of speed or strength, unlike Mjolnir. While Kelly was able to quickly defeat the Spartan 3 after with a palm strike, she took note that she would have easily torn her opponent's arm off if he or she were unaugmented. It should be noted that the Spartan was on the move moments later. Additionally, Mark G313 was able to support and haul the weight of Fred 104, who was equipped with Mjolnir Mark 6 armor and barely conscious, meaning his dead weight weighed approximately half a ton. Mark was noted at being the best sharpshooter of his detail, which at the time consisted of Team Sabre and Fred 104, who was the second best sniper among the Spartan 2s. Moreover, during Operation Jovian Whistle, Mark eliminated a Jirohane warrior by paralysing it with a precise blade strike to the spine, leading Fred 104 to deem Mark's skills exceptional, even by Spartan standards. Soon after, Mark eliminated numerous Jirohane warriors in close quarters combat, 
with nothing but his combat blade. Mark then continued his attack on the enemy by killing three Julhane warriors before any of them realised what was happening. He also killed a dozen enemies in six seconds with the help of Ash G099. In 2558, Spartan G059 engaged Avu Med Telkam and two Sangeli commanders in close quarters combat. She eliminated the two Sangeli with minimal effort and proceeded to finish off Telkam with three kicks, a punch, and a shot from an M6H Magnum. While Vita Lopez and her ferret team were on Neos Atlantis, Mark G313 dodged a knife strike from the corner of his eye and proceeded to pick up Spencer Hume, a 309 pound or 140 kilogram man, and use him as a human shield to block knife strikes from Ota Gallo. When Hume began to resist, Mark accidentally killed him by dealing a soft punch to his chest. Later on, Mark moved so quickly that a Dark Moon Enterprise agent shot himself in the feet when Mark abruptly forced his rifle downwards. Additionally, Ash G099 killed a Dark Moon Enterprise operative with three rabbit punches to the man's skull. Spartan 3's augmentations allow them to remain conscious and even function effectively while exposed to the vacuum of space for up to a minute. However, the Spartans will still suffer from the negative effects of exposure to space and require medical treatment directly after recovery. While on board a spacecraft, Kevin Alpha 282 walked through the forces of rapid key decompression while carrying Captain Darren Leone to safety. Later on, Kevin shot the rifle out of the hands of Ryan Larson from a quarter of a mile away and successfully jogged to his location before Ryan could recover. While most Spartan 3s were issued with a semi-powered infiltration armour as opposed to Mjolnir for budgetary reasons, a small number of Spartan 3 candidates, called Cat 2s by Kurt Ambrose, were set apart from the general population of the program by Ambrose and Franklin Mendes on the basis of possessing exceptional skill and performance either in general or in specific fields. These Spartans were removed from the program's mainline companies, given Mjolnir armour and assigned to separate special forces units. Kurt regarded the Cat 2 Spartan 3s as being on par with the Spartan 2s in regard to sheer natural ability, though he would also later assess Gamma Company on, the, on a whole as being comprised of the finest Spartans ever. Additionally, Dr. Catherine Halsey noted how Spartan B312's hyper-lethal rating was shared by only one other Spartan, and remarked that June A266 skills as a sniper were unmatched. Spartan B312 was also noted to have single-handedly broken insurrectionist organisations and made entire militia groups disappear. As they were attempting to escape Olympic Tower on Reach, June, Emil and Carter, all wearing Mjolnir armour, ran towards a fallout bunker around 36 miles an hour. While making his last stand on Reach, Spartan B312, likewise wearing Mjolnir armour, knocked out a Sangeli general with a single elbow strike and shot him twice in the head as he was struggling to get up. He then continued to make his final effort by dealing single strikes to multiple Sangeli Ultras and Sangeli Zealots, causing them to forcibly stagger backwards before being ultimately subdued himself. Overall, there are likely other as of yet unlisted augmentations that are either administered during the primary augmentation set or have since been implemented as backward compatible augmentations as developed for the Spartan 4s, but there are no directly referenced instances at this time. The Spartan 3s are their own brand of lethal, though their augmentations differ significantly from the Spartan 2s, being of a superior quality of augmentation, the survival rate being 100% as opposed to the Spartan 2s, coupled with the Spartan 3s near immunity to shock and ability to keep outputting lethal force long after even the toughest of Spartan 2s would have already succumbed to shock, makes the Spartan 3s a particularly devastating class of Spartans. While the side effects of the illegal augmentations added in by Carrot 51 makes them highly unpredictable and twitchy, even going so far as to be a threat to their fellow soldiers if not given timely dosages of smoothers, as long as this medication is administered sufficiently, the Spartan 3s maintain operational effectiveness on par with even the finest of UNSC soldiers. While created on a budget, the Spartan 3s are still hugely more expensive to produce and maintain than any other regular detachment of soldiers, but the savings made in their financial liability when compared to the Spartan 2s have still translated to combat effective Spartans on the battlefield and laid the foundation for more affordable augmentation sets with 100% survivability, paving the way for the Spartan 4s and likely many more generations of Spartans to come. With sufficient enough time span, there will inevitably come a time when Spartan grade augmentations will naturally permeat the human race through genetic engineering, and eventually elevate every human being in existence to the superior level of the Spartans, birthing a new human race that is stronger, faster, and more resilient, and more effective than we have ever been capable of. This will all be possible in the future due to the augmentation innovations made by Project Chrysanthemum 
and the Spartan 3s. Thanks for watching, stick a comment down below, I look forward to what you have to say. I want to give a quick shout out to my patrons, Nathan Silent Cartographer, Miguel, Brian, Sebastian and Holden, the holders of the mantle, Justin, Darian, Ty, Iron Griffin and Black Biscuit, my reclaimers, Zach, Deep Cover, Verbal Statue, Spesico, Spartan, A498, Guppy and Josh, my Metarchs, and all the other patrons who have jumped aboard to support the channel. I literally cannot put it into words how much that means to me, it's unparalleled. If you like Halo lore discussed at insane levels of detail, hit that subscribe button and the little bell icon so you're told the second a new video hits the shelves. Be sure to support us on all major social media channels including Discord, and if you really love the channel consider heading over to Patreon and supporting the channel over there. It would mean the world to me and would free up more of my time to put into this content and other Halo related goodness. Take it easy everyone and find peace in the domain.